Welcome. I didn't know it was a dress up day for church. I, uh, I brought my Ben, looked really sharp, dapper. I brought my Paul eye this morning. This is a, an old college injury infection from uh, every time you get worn down. Happens once a year. Don't worry about me. I got a, a bloodshot eye once a year for a couple days. Hi, hi, my name is Mike. I'm telling you all my HIPAA things going on in my life. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming to church. If you're on the live stream, good to see you. If you're in person, I'm glad to have you here. Um, I'm excited for this time. Uh, before we jump into this time, I have a short story that I think kind of helps set the mental stage for me um, as I've been contemplating this passage. I'm reminded of uh, Taekwondo and toilets. I have a, a generous grandpa, grandfather who's been my wife's Korean, and he's been uh, sending my kids to Taekwondo practice and they've been working through their belts. There's a million belts between the belt they are and where they want to be. But um, this last week they all were doing practice. And uh, Annie's like, Mike, you're a pastor. You gotta, you gotta pastor your kids. And she said it nicer than that. But that's the sound bite that I remembered. I'm like, yeah, she's right. And so I was at Taekwondo practice and one of my kids went off to the, to the bathroom and he went into one of the stalls and he was standing in the bathroom in the stall with a toilet and I'm like looking up like a, a dad I'm like I'm missing a kid where is he and so I went into the bathroom like hey what's going on bud how you doing what's going on and he's like telling me I'm just embarrassed it was hard it was difficult he didn't say that exactly but he said you know I was embarrassed it was hard I didn't know what to do I couldn't you know jump kick do something so I went to the bathroom and hid it in the toilet till it's over I'm like, that's great. Uh, practice is over. Get your coat on. Let's get in the car and let's leave. I don't want to have a convo in the bathroom stall with my son. And we're driving home. I'm like, what should I say to not traumatize my son? And uh, I thought, son, all over the city of Lincoln, there's men that have faced hard things in life, difficult, challenging things that are too hard for them. And when life hits you and it's difficult and hard, everyone runs to toilets in their life. And I rattle off some acceptable vices I want to tell a kid that young. And then I said, uh, did the toilet talk to you? Did it give you words of encouragement? Did you get a drink of water from the toilet to refresh your brain and soul as you went back out to face the day? He's like, no, no. And, you know, and I'm like, son, I'm your father. I've been through hard things too. I'm sitting on the edge of the Taekwondo mat right by the toilet. And you walked off to the toilet and not to me, your father. And so if you don't come to me, you're not going to go to your heavenly father someday, son. We got to be going to God when we have hard times. You got to go to earthly father when you have hard times. And my other son pipes up in the back of the van. He's like, that was good. You should share that in your sermon this weekend. I'm like, I'm like thanks, buddy. Thanks. So, but, but seriously, before we pray, when I was looking at this passage, and I was studying this passage, trying to go deep in this passage, I'm like, I don't want to go deep. This is hard. Because we talk about stuff at church. We talk about like, you know, drugs, alcohol, crack cocaine, and how that's bad. And you're like, yeah, shouldn't do that. You know, but this, this strikes close to home. This topic, what we're speaking on today, speaks to people in the room. Speaks to religious hypocr hypocrisy of religious people in the room. I'm a pastor's son. I grew up in different churches, on different church plants with my dad. I, I know the Christian game. I know how to play the Christian game. And I can play it as well as many, many of you. Does that make sense? And this passage is hard to study. This passage is hard to give. And this passage will be hard to listen to. Trust me. Jesus is going hard in the paint as he's facing uh, lunch with a bunch of religious elite as they work through the passage. So will you bow your heads? Let's ask for some help today. Lord, uh, we need your help. Uh, this strikes close to home or not, it probably will at the end of this message, Lord. I pray that you'd open our eyes so we can see wonderful things in your law. I pray that you'd let your word do what only your word can do. It correct, instruct, teach, rebuke, Lord, encourage. Uh, there's different sides of Jesus, Lord. There's the, the, the Jesus that goes to a social outcast, to a cripple, to a lame who won't break a bruised reed. And then there's a Jesus that's flipping tables and the Jesus we're going to read about today. Uh, there's a hard-nosed Jesus and a soft, tender Jesus, Lord. Uh, we need the different, we need to experience you today as people. We need to see you in your word correctly and clearly. Help us to see you clearly in your word today. And I ask that you just really instruct and convict and challenge our hearts. Open our eyes so we can see wonderful things in your law. And only, only you can do with us in your law. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week, Shane, we've been working through this message, and so Shane uh, was covering Jesus' public teaching. And commonly after a person finished a public teaching, 
they would invite that guest preacher from the local Jewish synagogue. They invite them back to the religious leader's house, the Pharisee's house, the religious lawyer's house. And they'd have a post church lunch gathering and they'd talk more about the message. And Jesus doesn't mince words. During lunch, he doubles down on everything he said earlier in, in the chapter. And so we're picking up in Luke 11, verse 37. If you'd read it along with me on the screen or on a Bible in front of you, it says this. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. So we're going to talk about hand washing to start our day. I'm a dad of a couple kids, I said earlier, and uh, my boys learned something during the pandemic. I think, it's, I think it's the pandemic, or it's that Mark Rober YouTube video on hand washing, but they learned something to wash their hands. And so when they come home from church today, the first thing they do without being prompted or told is they walk over and they wash their hands. We're not talking about physical cleanliness of hands. Does that make sense? So you don't think 21st century, think first century. We're talking about a religious Jewish custom that was acceptable custom about how to wash your hands. And it really mattered how you did it. If they poured water from here to the tips of your fingers or the tips of your fingers to your wrist, if the water dripped off the tips of your fingers or dripped off your elbows, if you dried your hands on a towel or on your robe or on your head, if you had a hand that was ceremonially washed correctly and a hand that wasn't, you can use one hand for non-etiquette stuff, another one for more etiquette stuff. It was a complex, rich Jewish custom and practice commanded by the Jewish teachers of the day. There's a certain specified way of doing it. And the heart behind the ritual was before eating anything, Jews had water poured over their hands to remove the defilement contracted by their contact with the sinful world. That was the heart of it. And Jesus gets invited to a lunch with a Pharisee. The host is watching Jesus to see if he would omit any of the customary rituals. And to his horror or his delight, Jesus goes on and he omits all of them. His friends, he offends. These aren't friends. These people he's eating with, he offends. He offends his host, and he offends his host friends as he goes through this meal. The title that Ryan helped me workshop earlier this week was Roast Over Roast. Because Jesus is going to roast people throughout this entire passage. I told you, it was a good, hard-hitting passage. If we are wise... As Christians here on Sunday morning, we should be very careful about how we listen to today's message. Because the reality is hypocrisy lives in you. It lives in me. It lives in all of us. And it just comes very naturally. I don't have to teach my kids how to be hypocrites. And as a kid, when you were a kid, you don't have to be taught how to be hypocritical. It's just something that comes out of you to pretend, to perform, to act. So let's look at verse 39. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. He's speaking to the religious leaders. He says, You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within. And behold, everything is clean for you. So I'm sure Jesus saw their facial expressions as they, the, the, the hands were not washed and then he continues to go right after the heart of the people. He, he, went, he didn't mince words. He went straight to the heart of the issue. And he spoke to their exact true nature. And so when you talk about hypocrisy, I think this is just an experience I've had as a parent. And as a parent preaching, you kind of can cheat and use a parenting analogy. And so my kids, when they were little, I would say, don't touch that outlet. Or do touch that pick up your toys. Or don't hit your sibling. Or do carry your dishes to the sink. There's very simple commands, do and don't. And when, I, when they were little, you know, chubby little babies grabbing stuff, moving it across the room. That was easy. But as they grew up, they kind of knew they had to obey. Because dad's four times, five times, six times bigger than them. They had to obey. Or there'd be consequences. And they're learning, they're learning something. They're like, I'll obey in my actions. But in my heart, I'm raging against this. <laughs> There's a rebellious heart as they rebelliously like picking up toys. And I don't want to act in front of you. You'll lose respect for me. But <laughs> they might be. But this is like the seeding of young teenage angst, which we're going after now as parents. But this, this, I'll obey, but I'm not really obeying on the inside. There's this du this duplicity that is in toddlers to teenagers' hearts. And as adults, we continue that duplicity into our life as people. And Jesus is speaking about that heart 
the issues of the heart, heart obedience, not just hand obedience. What is the heart of the issue? I'm going to take a moment and set this up more, but we strive, the heart of the issue is we strive to attain and achieve right standing with God. The heart of the issue is we strive to attain and achieve right standing with God. Even the spiritually elite cannot achieve right standing with God apart from the gospel. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light and, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If you remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he went through his teaching this very famous hallmark sermon and he went through these different topics and he said, if you lie, you're, he says, if you lie, you're a liar. If he says, if you murder, if you have undeserved anger for your brother, you've murdered them in your heart. If you commit adultery, if you have adultery of the mind by looking at lust of a young lady, he went along and said, murdering is murdering of the mind and, and adultery is adultery of the heart. He came along and took the moral law of standard of human achievement to be right of God's eyes and showed the reality that it is actually unattainable. It is beyond our measure as people. It is out of grasp for us as people. And Jesus is doing that same exact thing here that he did to the masses on the Sermon on the Mount. He's doing that to the religious elite, the professional believers, the professional faith people. He takes an exact look at the heart of who they are and what they desperately need. The reality is our world is filled with people that are desperately wanting to be viewed better than they are. Not just toddlers, not just teenagers all the way up into our lives, into our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s, our 60s, our 70s. We want to be looked and viewed better than we really are. This world is filled with people that do not really care, but want to look like they care. This world is filled with people that do not pray, but want to look like they pray. They do not read their Bible, but they want to be perceived as Bible readers. That are not moral, but they want to be perceived as moral. That is the reality of our culture we are in. And that was a reality of the culture that Jesus was speaking to then. We as people, are obsessed with the outside of the cup. The image, the brand, the reputation. We are obsessed with, with your image, your brand, your reputation. It's very American of you. It's very human 101 of Jesus addressing this very human core problem. We can all relate to this message today. Jesus knew that the religious leaders could obey on the outside but disobey on the inside. You can obey on the outside and disobey on the inside. You can go to community group with a really bad heart. You can come to church with a really bad heart. You could obey your Bible verse for the day with a horrendous heart. You can love your child really poorly on the heart, but fake it on the outside. God, the reality is God sees our motives and our motives matter to God. And people are motivated by their motives. And God sees our motives. God wants our motives to be right on the inside as they are on the external. On the inside need of the cup needs to be transformed by the gospel as well as the external. God made our insides and our outsides. And when God makes something, he's a master and creator and understands it incredibly well. God understands your thoughts, your motivations, your desires, your intentions of your heart. He made those. He understands those. And he wants the inside of you as a person to be, to be pure just like the outside. I was encouraged by a brother sharing this verse. Psalms 36, Psalms 36, verses 25. It's talking about this heart problem we have as people. Psalms, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, verse 25 to 27. It says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. There's this hard heart of stone that we inherited, that we've had since our childhood, and God takes that heart away from us with the gospel. God wants you to be pure on the inside and the outside. So if it was lunch today and Jesus was addressing this church, post the sermon at lunch, he'd be speaking to the lifers, the in-Christian crowd, the pastors, the staffers, the pastor kids. He'd be speaking to us who, who, who make, a, make a more than just a you know, quarterly frequent visit to this place, but are, but are known as a member of this church. The, the people who master the art of the spoken being nice and polite, but the unspoken being selfish and self-centered. Jesus is addressing the hypocrisy to his audience at that table of extort, their extortion of the poor and the wickedness in the leader's heart. 
If it was today, Jesus would say things like, you may like your friend's post, but inwardly you are full of jealousy. Jesus is stressing the importance of the inward and the outward being in unity for us to be authentic in our walk of God. See, Jesus is not looking for a bunch of hipster, hypocritical Christians to change the world. They can't change nothing. We need to be authentically, genuinely changed from the inside out by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel genuinely changes the person's inner life and their exterior life, both and. When the inner life, the inner motivations, the inner desires are transformed by the gospel, everything on the outside comes into focus and is able to be changed drastically simpler. And when that happens, when the inner man or woman is authentically changed by the gospel, the exterior person is changed by the gospel too, there's an authenticity to our walk. There's a genuineness to our faith. The lost can see a fake. They can see a hypocrite. They can see a con man. And God's name is not glorified when there's this, this conflict with the inner and the exterior. Jesus is God. And we need to think and pause and pray about that. Since Jesus is God... God's nature is not our nature. God judges the inwardness of man and the inner private intimate side of people that no one sees but that person. And so like when I see you, I see you. And I assume the best about what is behind closed doors in your private life. But God sees you and he sees the inner you at the same simultaneous time. He sees the outward manifestations of your public person and he sees the private manifestations of you when no one is else watching. God created the inside and the outside, and he judges them both rightly and fairly simultaneously. God judges people's motivations, attitudes, and God is and will judge the seen and the unseen. This is very bad news for religious people who are live for a performance-based relationship with each other and performance-based relationship with God. God sees, God judges, and God judges correctly. And you cannot, I cannot, we will not con God or mislead God. God desires the inner brand and the outer brand to be working in complete unity of the gospel. Why does Jesus care about the inner and the outer person? Why does Jesus care about your motives? Does it matter? Uh, hands down, yes, it matters. It matters to Jesus. It matters all throughout your Bible. When you're working, when you do religious work, religious manifestations of the gospel and life transformational work, and your walk of God is off. You don't draw people closer to God. You push them farther from God. Like I said earlier, people are excellent at sniffing out fakes, fake Christian, disingenuous leaders, and hypocrisy. The biggest problem with Christianity in our city is hypocritical Christians. Theologically, the this, this belief structure is incredibly sound. I argue amazingly sound the best minds and businesses in the world to try to dismantle it from the academic side. It is undefeated. It is defeated if a bunch of hypocritical, hypocritical Christians walk around being and pretending something they're not. Our external actions and our internal motivations both can be changed by the gospel. Our external actions and our internal motivations both can be only changed by the gospel. Only the gospel produces a holistic life change that people desire. I went on a rabbit trail. Come back to verse 42. Jesus continues his roasting. He says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rude and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the other. You need to know woe is an expression of regret. The Pharisees is a religious leader. It's like a modern pastor, clergy. It's like a career religious worker. And Jesus is grieved over the Pharisees. And he's going to work through a variety of topics systematically as we go through this passage. And he starts with their practices of finances. The tithe. In the Jewish culture, the tithe is supposed to be a command. In Leviticus 27 and Deuteronomy 14, it's supposed to be a, a joyful love offering of a, a tenth of the person's income. Uh, just to show their gratitude and their love and their admiration and their dependence on God. Their generosity, their stewardship, their faith, God's faithfulness and their faithfulness. And it's just supposed to be a love offering to God done from an abundance of joy and worshiping God. To take a tenth of your tithe and go down to a tenth of your garden herbs made a mockery of it. This finely tuned attention to detail way of living took the love out of the law. People tend to add man-made rules to God's rules. 
And we can add to the law of God and miss the heart of God behind the law of God. The heart of God is to do what is right and don't neglect the love of God. We are prone to champion the trivial, prone to champion our preferences, our opinion, and we tend to not champion a genuine, authentic love for God. We are, to, we are to stand on the word of God and not make a stand on preferences, opinions, and trivial matters. Where the Christian walk gives us liberty and Christian freedom, allowing us to have liberty and rest and work. And if I take the Christian freedom and God's grace and God's acceptance and God's forgiveness for me, and I turn around on you and I give you judgment, slander, shunning, cancel culture, that's hypocritical. That's wrong. Grace for me, law for you. Leniency on me, legalism for you. There's a disconnect. And at our worst, Christianity in America has this everywhere. You got to see the hypocrisy, right? The macro structure of Christianity is God reconciling people to God and the grace to God that we experience as people. We have trouble giving that same grace to the people around us. And God gives them grace and we don't. Verse 43, woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. So the best seat in the synagogue. So in a Jewish synagogue, there'd be people gathering and the Pharisees would sit up front in their fancy robes in a seat facing the congregation. And so as a person was teaching, a rabbi was teaching, they'd sit there and they'd be like, nodding or scowling or furling their brow and the whole congregation would look to them to take cues for how to respond to what was taught and they used that platform for manipulation for self-centeredness for their vanity for their narcissism they used that platform for their personal gain we have this rampart in christianity religious people pastors using their platform to manipulate people con people for their personal gain and feed their narcissism we see this all over american christianity this verse jesus words is brutal to those demographics we should use our position to serve people not to have them serve you we should use our people to love them and lead them to christ not to manipulate them people would greet them in the marketplace it's like people would greet you at aldi's we shop at all these, some, some of us, right? Almost fell over. <laughs> People would gush over them at the grocery store in the marketplace. And I found this this last week and I thought this was hysterical. So I'm going to share it with you. They would say things like, oh, Rabbi, glorious doctor of the Torah, repo repository of Solomonic epigrams, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. Just this gushy speech to their, their, their Pharisee, their local religious leader. When I see y'all at all these, we act like we don't know each other. <laughs> I'm kidding. I give you an, I'll give you a wave. But if we're honest in verse 43, we do this today as Christians. Vanity, pride, self-centeredness, narcissism is very common in Christianity. It's almost celebrated in a subculture of Christianity. I just don't get it. I think we'd get over it by now. But we just keep going back to that well and keep drinking. Pharisees had a preoccupation with the outward, with people loving them in the public eye. This should sound very familiar to us. Being a pastor's son, I could walk into churches I didn't start, people I didn't know, and they'd know me because of my last name and they knew my dad. People knew me, they thought highly of me, not because they knew me, because they knew my dad. I know how this world works. And, and I'm not saying, I'm saying there's a danger there that we should be aware of. God is not a respecter of people. God does not show partiality and favoritism. If you're a lifer, you might have been raised by parents who wanted the praise of their peers more than the praise of God, and they really wanted you to perform in public. That's a level of hypocrisy, being different in one arena and not the same in another arena. This type of hypocrisy, people live their lives built on it, conceal sin, hide sin, lie, omit, misrepresent the truth, minimize things to look better in the eyes of Christian circles. That's hypocrisy. That's wrong. This kind of living is a ticking time bomb and God hates hypocrisy. God will not be mocked and we will reap what we sow, believers. So pay attention as we work through this passage. If Jesus was giving this sermon in the year 2022, he would roast us for our hypocrisy we've seen online. 
You edit your quiet time photo of your Bible with filters and specialized hashtags, but you haven't really connected with me in the Bible for months. You like your friends' photos, but inwardly you desire harm to befall them. Your real emotion you feel is jealousy, not love. Jealousy emojo, emojo, not love emojo. I don't know what that is either. You post these photos of you and your cool, popular, beautiful friends the one time you hang out with them in months, but you neglect all the average normal people I've set in your life daily. We have hypocrisy in the Christian culture. Let's be honest. We should all be brutally honest. This passage is difficult to work through. Social media puts our hypocrisy in hyperdrive, and it's not just for toddlers and teenagers on TikTok. It's for all of us. Does that make sense? All of us. It just shows what's happening in our hearts. The reality is in our hearts, there is no space for good deeds to flow from. Apart from Christ, hypocrisy is as far as you can get. Apart from Christ, hypocrisy is as good as it will get in your Christian life. Even our best days, all of our lives apart from God are a sad, lame sitcom joke that the angels in heaven are not laughing at. Men and women, this is real. Jesus gets serious about it. I think we should get serious about it in our own lives. Verse 45, so Jesus is speaking to a group of people and then he pivots on verse 45 to another demographic that's sitting at the table. This is a lawyer, a professional legal expert on the Torah, the Old Testament law. They spent a career studying the Old Testament law. They're a religious lawyer. I never heard of that. I don't think you can Google a religious lawyer uh, and have someone show up on Google. Verse 45 is, this is Jesus talking to a religious lawyer. He says, one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, this is Jesus. He's asking Jesus, is in saying these things, you insult us also. A Pharisee is a professional religious worker. A, a lawyer is like their wingman. They know the Bible, they know the Torah, and they're able to help spin the Bible, make it say what they want, when they want, where they want. And they, they know the law really, really well. They're expert teachers of the law, but they really add to the law is what we'll find. If you think of the Bible, a little background, there's 613 commands in the Bible. 365 of them are in the negative posture. 248 of them are in the more positive disposition, positive posture. posture. That's moral law, uh, social law, and uh, Ceremonial law, that is what the Jewish nation is working through. Just some context, the United States federal law includes more than 300,000 rules and regulations. So 613, Bible. 300,000 rules and regulations. That's more than the city of Lincoln, I think. Even if you count Hickman. More than the city of Lincoln, men and women. 613 isn't that bad. So these religious lawyers and these Pharisees were adding to the, to the law, the Old Testament law. They were adding thousands of extra laws. And about 6,000 total laws were being added to the 613 laws. So let's read verse 46. It says, And he said, Woe to you, lawyer, also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So the hypocrisy here is in verse 46. They took these traditions and customs, and they made them more important than the law itself. So rest on the Sabbath. That's what they're talking about, carrying burdens on the Sabbath, resting on the Sabbath. A Jew is supposed to rest from the work of God, the work God has given them, and be with the people God has placed them with, and enjoy God and enjoy their life on the Sabbath, to take a rest from their physical labor, just like God rested one day a week when he built the whole everything. Uh, in the beginning, God created everything. He took a break on day seven, the Sabbath, and the Jews are supposed to model that also. So that's the spirit of laws. Don't do a ton of physical labor that one day a week, but rest and enjoy God and what God gave you. So the spirit of law. The addition to the law is an example from below. The Shabbat, chapter 10, verse 3. This is not the Bible. This is what we're talking about. On the Sabbath taught, a man may not carry a burden in his right hand or on his left in his bosom or on his shoulder. But if he carries it on the back of his elbow or in his ear or in his hair or in the wallet mouth downward or between his wallet and his shirt or in the hem of his shirt or, on his, or in his shoe or in his sandal. 
Some of you, you're like, eh. yes, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's confusing. It's complicated. It took the spirit of the law and added a whole bunch of secondary man-made rules behind it. These religious lawyers wrote and exercised loopholes that they rarely followed themselves. The average person that heard that at a Jewish temple would just have quit on this pursuit of God and understanding who God is, who this God is, and how it relates to their life. You mentally checked out me just reading that list. If you sat in that list day after day, hour after hour, <laughs> sermon after sermon, no. <laughs> it would make it be impossible. Uh, the religious, these religious professional employees were supposed to teach God's word in such a way that helped inspire the people instead of making them feel burdened and burned out when they left. People are coming to hear about God and desiring to draw close to God. Instead, after hearing these teachings, they left confused about God and feeling farther from God. The gospel is simple. It's so simple, your kids upstairs are learning about the gospel. It is a powerful, simple tool that God uses to change and transform and radically change lives. But the gospel is also complex, and you can, and God willing, will spend the rest of your life appreciating it, studying it, learning the multifaceted beauty of the gospel. But the gospel is supposed to draw people to God. Supposed to draw the believer who's being saved to God. Verse 47 Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your father killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you built their tombs. So Jesus is talking about virtue signaling. Building a tomb for the people your parents killed. The point of Jesus saying here is corporate sin and guilt continues among the descendants of the wicked unless they repent. Good deeds apart from repentance isn't, doesn't make the bad deeds go away. We have to repent. We have to humbly confess our failures and our shortcomings and repent. Exodus 20, verse 5, Deuteronomy 23, verses 2 through 6, 1 Samuel 15, 2 through 3, and Isaiah 1, verse 4. Talk more about this. I don't care what you say publicly. I don't care what you post online. God is looking for a genuine, authentic, confessing, humbling repentance. And that's what can change things. Nothing good can happen apart from our sin, apart from us starting off with humility and confession and repentance. The reality is Jesus is eating lunch with folks who would kill him if the Romans were not in charge of their country. That was viewed as civil unrest. And they had a long history of killing prophets like him who rocked the boat. They later will kill John the Baptist, I believe. But the Roman occupation views this as civil unrest. And if they weren't in charge, they would probably have stoned him and killed him. They later killed Jesus. The people at this table and their friends killed Jesus. Jesus, John the Baptist is considered the greatest prophet of all time. His enemies killed him. Jesus gets killed by these religious leaders later in the book of Luke. Hypocrisy in good works is still hypocrisy. Verse 49. Therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this, gener against this generation. From the blood of Abel, the first martyr in the Bible, to the blood of Zechariah, the last prophet before John the Baptist, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, which is viewed as the third most holiest place for Jews. They went and killed him in the third most holiest place. Yet, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. So that is... What happened to Abel and Zechariah was nothing compared to what Jesus is about to go through. The lawyers, this generation that killed Jesus, called the greatest, they killed John the Baptist, the greatest prophet. They went on to kill the word of God himself, Jesus Christ, because of their hypocrisy and their jealousy. The blood of all those slain for their, faithful, their faithfulness to God will be required of this generation that rejected the ultimate and final prophet, priest, king, Jesus the Messiah. Verse 52, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. For he went away from there, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard, and to invoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. The purpose of Scripture, of you reading your Bible, is under a better understanding and knowledge of God. The purpose of what I'm trying to do here, teach the Bible to you, is to help you have a deepening understanding and knowledge of God. Because knowledge of God lights up, it illuminates your life, your heart, your mind, 
And God changes the heart. He changes the mind through the word of God. And the whole rest of a man or woman can be transformed as your mind is renewed, as your mind is transformed. Our purpose is to help you grow in knowledge of God. The teachers of the law, the lawyers of scripture, made everything about the Bible confusing and complicated. That people couldn't grasp the real nature of God. And they'd walk away from a God that was confusing and overbearing. They turned the Bible into obscure obscurities, riddles that only the experts could understand, but they wouldn't explain to people. I am reminded and sobered by these two verses in 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Timothy 4, talking about what we're trying to do here as a church today. It says, do your best, present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And then chapter, chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Jesus' opponents mishandled the word of God. And Jesus' opponents were livid with him for calling them out on it. This intense venom, this hatred to Jesus to catch him and to hunt him down and what he said and did was intense. And all the while, Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem. The context of this whole narrative is just is this next chunk of the book of Luke. He's moving to Jerusalem. He's going into dark arenas and dark chapters of heavier and heavier hitting chapters with more and more enemies of God attacking Jesus. This heated exchange we looked at today boils over to the next chapter, which Dan will pick up next week for us. And it, it ends with the last third of the book of Luke, which focuses on the systematic dismantling of Jesus, the God man. To the point where the disciples think that all hope is lost and the popularity and fame of Jesus is destroyed. But God. God's ways are not like our ways. God saw a way. God made a way when there was no way. Before the world began, people knew. God knew what would happen. He predicted and he prophesied that the bruised heel would crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 4. God's perfect providential plan is being rolled out in Luke 11. So as we close, these woes should strike a warning to theologians, teachers, and leaders in the church today. But I don't work with the leaders of the churches today. I work with y'all. I'm with y'all. Every discipleship group leader should take, take stock of this passage. Every community group leader should take stock of this passage. Every community group apprentice, every college staff, every campus director, every missionary, Every pastor should read and think, but for the grace of God, this could be me. Because Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, without the grace of God, we're on the road to hypocrisy. That is our fallen condition. Our, our original disposition of our heart is it is too hard to pursue a relationship with God. It's too scary. It's too high stakes. I'm going to go to the toilet. I'm going to hide in the toilet of acceptable Christian sins. And I'm going yeah, to drink from the water of hypocrisy. Because that is easier in your mind's eye than actually having a real relationship with God. A meaningful, so an application for all of us, if you're like, I'm new to Christianity, this is crazy, or I've been here my whole life, this is, this is, this is not fun, Mike, you know, why don't, why don't you get the easy passages, Mike? Uh, it's the Bible, it's hard, all of it. It's, there's good parts too. But the, an application for us all, it seems to always start with our time with the Lord. A meaningful time of God. A meaningful time of you and your Bible for you and God. Not to be shared at community group. Not to be spammed out to your roommates. Not to be call your mom and tell her about you read the Bible. I mean, it's just supposed to be for a private thing between you and God. No Instagram story, live reels about this moment. This is like you and God. Not for display. You in private and God time. You reading the word of God. You praying scripture. You praying what's on your heart. You letting God speak to you. As I've read my Bible, there's many a days I'll be reading along thinking, punky dory Mike, lighthearted Mike. And I read a passage, I'm like, oh, I'm going to write that down in my journal. I'll look at it later in the day. And I'm like, oh, yep, that's for the meaning I just walked out of. I was a hypocrite. Or that's me I'm walking into. I'm going to be tempted to be a hypocrite. That daily connection of God, because the presence of God drives out hypocrisy from, our, from he can't stand to be around hypocrites. Being with God in a relationship with God, a pursuing a loving walk with God helps flush out the attitudes, dispositions, and affections in my heart. It changes my heart. Going to God daily with the gospel and reading the Bible, reading throughout the gospels of Jesus' life, what he said and he did is so refreshing. 
The book of Psalms is so good for me to process my emotions and what I'm thinking. If you're beat up or discouraged, run down, look at the book of Psalms. It is an amazing, refreshing thing of how you, they take his thoughts captive and give his concern to birth the Lord and worshipfully praises God. It models for us how to think healthy as Christians. Men and women, the Bible is your word to feed your soul. We have to read the Bible daily and genuinely, authentically connect to God through prayer and reading of the Bible. Because, because hypocrisy lives in you, it lives in me, it comes naturally to all of us. Nothing can address our motivations, our intentions of our heart like God and his word. God always seems to poke the hypocrite in the eye. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the word of God and how it can transform lives if we let it. It's powerful enough to protect itself if we let it out in our lives, God. You are a God who takes amazing care of your sons and daughters. I ask that you just teach us, Lord, how to walk with you and abide in you. As individuals and as a corporate church, we just love you and thank you for the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.